Meet the Dean of Montclair State's College of the Arts next on Carpe Diem. Hello, I'm Mark Rosenwig, Assistant Professor of Television and Digital Media at Montclair State University. Our guest on this edition of Carpe Diem is Dan Gerskis, Dean of MSU's College of the Arts. He arrived at Montclair State last summer from Brooklyn College, where he was a professor and chair of the Department of Film and special assistant to the president. Gerskis has held creative and management positions in film, television, theater, and advertising. He's an Emmy Award winner and has written numerous screenplays for television. Dan, welcome to the program and welcome to our campus. Thanks. Glad to be here. Tell us how it all started for you. When did you get interested in, in film, television, and media? How young were you and uh, what, what sparked it all? Well, my original interest was in theater, like a lot of kids, and um, I did that for quite a bit of time. Uh, when I got to the end of my four years in college, I was applying to uh, graduate programs in film and graduate programs in theater. And I was uh, accepted at uh, two institutions, uh, one of which in film told me that they would tell me how much money they would give me after I accepted. And the other, uh, Brandeis, where I actually ended up going, told me up front. And so um, I come from a background that is not, uh, uh, is modest. And uh, so the finances determined that initial step. You, you weren't uh, like Steven Spielberg, though, sitting in the basement making these little films in high school or anything like uh, that? You know, I did a couple of those, but mm -hmm. they, not with that kind of uh, obsession that he had. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really what happened was uh, after I'd been in the theater for a while, uh, I got an agent, and uh, my agent said to me, uh, you can continue to write plays, I'll be happy to represent you, or you could actually make a living. And, uh, and I said, how do you do that? And he said, well, TV and film, and that's what brought me into that. So how would, how would you explain the differences to us between what you've done in TV, what you've done in film with screenplays and so on, and the different formats, and, and can you mix and match and, and go back and forth between the two easily? Well, primarily I've always written for long form. So the, the stuff that I did for TV, with the exception of something like the documentary on Jimmy Stewart, uh, really was very much like a film. It, you know, it was uh, 90 minutes, 120 minutes for HBO or for Showtime. Uh, and shot one camera as we would uh, shoot a film. So really the distinctions between the two for me were not very great. It was essentially working in the same form but in two different media. Now tell us about the Jimmy Stewart documentary that you mentioned because that's an Emmy Award winner, right? It was, and yeah. Tell us how did that all come about? How was it structured? Where did it play, et cetera? Yeah, um, I, I had been doing some things for HBO and for Cinemax at that time, and uh, Franchet, who was the, uh, the head of uh, on-air promotion, uh, managed to arrange an interview with Jimmy Stewart. And so she actually did the Jimmy Stewart part of it, and I did all of the other elements and uh, interviewed several critics and, uh, and wrote the script for it. So it was a, it was a, it was a collaborative effort. It ran as a, as a documentary on Cinemax. What kind of interview was he? Was he a good interview? Or? He was, well, yeah. he was great. Was he? Absolutely yeah. great. Uh, he, uh, so modest. You know, everything was always as a result of his good luck. It was never uh, anything to do with his talent. Uh, always referring to the fact that he was so blessed. I mean, just a really gracious, uh, gentle person. Because you never know how some of these stars are going to be as interviewees. Uh, Robert De Niro is supposed to be a, a terrible interview. Well, there, I mean, there are a good many of them who, who just clam up or want to be, uh, you know, make a statement about, uh, about who they are. But he was, he was just the opposite. He was from the old school of, uh, of the golden age of the studios where they were expected to do a lot of publicity, where um, when they were out and, uh, and promoting the film. So he, he was accustomed to, to being interviewed and being friendly and promoting himself. Is he your favorite actor or do you have 
somebody else who's number one in, in your mind? Uh, I, I like his work. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely fond of the films that he did. Um, mm -hmm. I tend not to rate actors or films. Uh, I have a deep appreciation for a great many actors and for a great You just ruined films. my next question. Oh. I was going to ask for your favorite <laughs> film. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, all right, top three. <laughs> uh, well, it changes on, on any right? given yeah. it, on any given day. It changes. Yeah. Uh, I have um, a long list of films that I would watch at any time of the day or night. Uh, and uh, when I taught screenwriting, um, I frequently professors will run the film and they'll leave the room. Uh, and for me, I always sat there. So I think uh, you know, I, when I've probably seen uh, The Godfather uh, three dozen times by now. Um, as well as uh, a number of other films. Always, always a favorite, The Godfather. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's one of a kind, incredible. Um, how about the evolution of your, your doing films, you're doing screenplays, et cetera. How did you transition to teaching? How did, how did that all happen? Well, I think a, an important thing for, uh, for people to understand when they enter the media uh, businesses uh, is that it is very much a young person's game. Uh, there are new generations coming in and old generations moving out. Uh, and at a certain point, I had realized that as a writer, I had not reached the critical mass that would allow me to continue into my 50s and 60s. There are just really a handful of writers who are capable of doing that. Uh, and coincidental to that, I had a nightmare one night in which I was uh, 65 years old and pitching story ideas at studios to a 22-year-old. Uh, and uh, I woke up, not in a cold sweat, but I woke up uh, uh, very sobered by that uh, dream. And, and now having three kids in their 20s, it's, uh, it's even more horrific than it was at that time. Uh, but it occurred to me then that the, my subconscious was telling me that I should probably think about doing something else. Um, I'd done some guest lectures for friends of mine who were in uh, higher education. I enjoyed it. I, uh, I always enjoyed being in the classroom as a student. So um, I started that process of, uh, of looking for a teaching job. And uh, I, was, uh, I was rejected by some of the finest institutions in this country. I think a number of us were, yes. Uh, before uh, before uh, Brooklyn College had the great wisdom to hire me. <laughs> 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 and what about that transition, though? I mean, as far as being able to teach the skills, mentor students, and so on, how difficult was that transition? How hard? A lot of people think, well, I have all these professional skills, I can just go and teach, and that's it. But it's work, right? It is, it is work, but I think the advantage of having been um, a screenwriter is that you're constantly trying to, when you're in that position in a commercial setting, uh, you're trying to get a sense of the temperature in the room. Uh, often trying to uh, reconcile very differing points of view. Uh, if you're writing for hire, you might have a producer and a director, studio executives who, who are not agreeing on what the direction of the project should be. So just the general sense of being someone who could work with people, I think, carried over as an important skill. Um, I started out, as I said, in the theater. I was at one time, um, I will admit, an actor. Uh, and uh, so the ability to lecture, to get in front of a group of people, to make uh, a class interesting was something that came fairly easily to me. Uh, and in terms of mentoring, I always had a great uh, love and respect for my students, so I was interested in their welfare. So, so all of it came together, I think, really pretty easily for me. And then you started to make the transition to being an administrator. Right. How did that all come about, and what kind of transitions are needed to, to do that effectively? Well, I had been active um, in a lot of uh, what we refer to as uh, service. Uh, I'd, I'd served on a lot of committees at the college level. I'd served on uh, committees uh, within the department. So I was fairly attuned to the workings of the administration and, and gaining more of that as the years progressed. Uh, and I realized that I, I had an aptitude for that. Um, I, I enjoyed doing it, and I felt that at that time there was a need for someone in that department to step forward and really provide some leadership. Uh, so that was really the motivating factor. There was an opportunity and, uh, and an interest, uh, and I, as, after I started to do it, I realized that I liked it, and, uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, do you miss teaching? I do. I uh -huh. do, yeah. Uh, it, I found, though, even as the chair of a department, it was very difficult to have the time and the energy to focus on classes, which, if you take seriously, 
uh, really require a great deal of energy. And often uh, other projects are really very time sensitive um, and the class would become the last thing on, on the list of, of things to do. And, and often it was unfair to the students. So I, I knew even as a chair that it would be difficult to continue doing that if I became a dean. Now for those of us uh, who are on campus, we're a little bit familiar with what a dean does, but for those who are not on a campus, what does a dean do? Well, the dean is the, uh, the academic, uh, administrative, and financial leader of a college, which is a, a sort of a unit uh, of the university. So uh, we are in the College of the Arts, and that consists of the School of Communication and Media, the School of Music, the Department of Art and Design, and the Department of Theater and Dance. Uh, and really, I'm here to provide uh, leadership in a wide number of areas uh, to, uh, to enable faculty and students to accomplish what they want to accomplish, to make sure that we have the resources, uh, financial and otherwise, to do what needs to be done. There are a number of deans at other places who have told me that they're spending up to half of their time these days in fundraising related activities. Um, is that something that's become too much a part of the job or just a necessary evil, so to speak? Uh, it, well, I think anyone who is in higher education administration, the upper administration, has to deal with the reality of that right now. Um, because I'm fairly new here and we're really just ramping up in a lot of areas, I've not spent a huge amount of time on that. But when we think about fundraising, there are many different aspects to that. And it's not just always going and asking for, uh, for money from someone. I mean, there are elements of what we call stewardship, where you're really trying to cultivate relationships with, uh, with donors, with alumni. Uh, and, and those are actually among the more pleasant responsibilities of the job, to get out and meet people who, who, who've been at MSU, who've uh, had great experiences here, who have a great affection for the institution. Uh, it, it can be a lot of fun. How about the individual programs? What can you tell us, if you would give us an update on, you mentioned the four major areas, uh, the schools and the departments and so on. Um, I'll be biased and ask you to start with uh, communication and media. Sure. Because we, uh, we just launched. Yes. Uh, well, as, uh, as we know, Merrill Brown, the director, right. uh, has had a, an enviable career uh, in, in media uh, with a heavy emphasis on journalism. So we expect a journalism a major to be coming online uh, as soon as possible, uh, ideally next fall. But uh, as we know, the calendar, the academic calendar is always not cooperative with those kinds of uh, initiatives. But, but that's certainly something that's going to be coming down the road in the, in the School of, uh, of Communication and Media. Um, as far as the other uh, departments and schools are concerned, uh, we're really just investigating right now and seeing where the strengths are, where the potential flagship programs are, uh, looking for ways to raise the visibility of those, um, doing some analysis of maybe some uh, under-enrolled programs that, uh, that, that might not be um, in the best interest of the college to continue. So it's, it's, uh, it's still very much an investigative process for me and, and the various heads. We have a tremendous facility here in the Castor Theater, and that's something that I think those who are watching this program in the public who are not familiar with it should know, should know something about it and all the uh, programs there, right? Sure. The Castor Theater is a, is a beautiful, uh, beautiful facility of about 500 seats. Uh, it's the, um, the home of, um, of Peak Performances, which is a, um, a professional uh, presenting and producing uh, arm of the university. It's also uh, where our music and musical theater students perform. Um, we have uh, also outside programs. Montclair Film Festival um, screens there, has, uh, has events there. Uh, and it's, it's generally uh, serving a wide range of, um, of uses. What do you say to students and their parents who are contemplating a career in the arts today? What are the opportunities? What are the difficulties? How do you assess? And I know we're talking about a number of different types of, of art here, but what's, what's your overall view of uh, this as a, a future for students? Well, I, I, people want a return on, on investment. That's, I've had three kids uh, uh, either in college or out of college now, uh, and certainly uh, having paid those tuition bills, um, which I'll continue to pay for many years into the future, uh, I'm, you know, I'm very sensitive to uh, the feeling that they want to get something back. Uh, I think there's a danger, though, in thinking of, of college uh, 
as a quid pro quo. If I do this, it'll end up that I can do this professionally. And, uh, and, and people are making connections which I think are not always, um, always helpful in terms of long range plans. What we want is to help students succeed not just their first year out of college, but their 10th year, their 15th year, their 20th year. So how do we prepare students for a world that, that doesn't exist? Uh, and that's the real challenge. So if, if parents and students come to the university experience, the, the college experience, as something that's only going to help them in the near future, I think that they, um, they're really missing what could be the essential part of the educational experience. So we're thinking about preparing students, or, or we're aiming to prepare students in, in a number of areas that are not discipline specific, that are not major specific. We want people who can think critically, who can express themselves uh, in words, uh, whether on the page or, or just in, in conversation. Um, and those skills will serve them five years, ten years. We want them to be able to learn on their own, to, uh, to learn new ways, to be able to put aside old ways, to be flexible, to collaborate. And those skills really are central to everything that we do in the College of the Arts. So what you're really talking about is setting them up for lifelong learning, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we want them to make a living, but we also want them to be able to make a life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look at the futures of these arts individually, what do you see? Because a lot of us, we have internal debates here many times about, you know, what the future of this area of media is going to be or what the issue of, you know, the, the future of television or film and so on. How do you gauge that? What's, what's your assessment now, say five years out in, in a couple of these areas? Well, if I knew, I could be very rich. <laughs> and tell me so I can <laughs> cash exactly, in. Too, exactly, right, yeah. exactly right, exactly yeah. right. Um, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, we can see trends. We can see that, um, that for example, uh, print newspapers are, um, are going the way of buggy whips, uh, that they will exist perhaps in some fashion. But, you know, what's become evident is that the new technologies that are available to us are, are in many ways superior. When we're following a storm, like the one that we've just had, Having a newspaper come out at 4.30 in the afternoon, if it could be delivered, uh, is not as helpful to people who really need information right now. They need to know that this hurricane is coming. So I don't, although I know traditionalists uh, decry the decline of the print newspaper, um, I think in many respects we're in a better place now with all of these other opportunities. And so I, and I do think that um, in all areas of the arts and media, we're going to be moving more toward um, those kinds of dynamic ways of gaining information and distributing information. Along the lines of uh, Hurricane Sandy, I was in a debate with a colleague the other day who, who keeps saying to me, well, you know, don't you think um, local television stations are going away and so on? I said, well, there's a tremendous public service there and we see it with Sandy, we see it with other things, we also see it that they've leveled off financially and so on. So it's like p part of our job, I think, is to have those internal debates and to try to gauge what's happening, but it's, it's difficult, right? It's, it is. It is. Uh, I'm, my wife is in television, uh, television news, uh, and I've I've watched the um, the audiences shrink. But I do think that there has been a bottoming out, uh, uh, and television remains uh, an exceptionally good medium for gaining eyeballs when you want to get a lot of eyeballs. And uh, even though there are fewer now than there were in the past it's still the place that people go to. Uh, there's no doubt a graying of the audience if you watch an evening newscast. Um, it's kind of like the Republican Party. No, I just, <laughs> no political bias, no, right, right, just the facts. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you look at the kinds of ads that are on the evening news, uh, it's, I have to say it's somewhat sobering uh, to, to see who they're pitching their, um, their commercial wares to. Uh, but having said that, uh, I'd also add that I, I don't think that television news is going away completely. Uh, I don't think that television is going away completely. Uh, people are making the adjustment now uh, in terms of audiences. The networks understand that their shows are being seen on computer screens, on smartphones, uh, and, and gradually they are coming to embrace that and are less fearful of what that means. Yeah, I, I uh, heard some comments from Les Moonves, who runs CBS the other day, talking about the fact that he's making more of their 
shows available for Hulu and other places and so on to, to increase the distribution. And then he came out and said, well, guess what? Channel 2 in New York just uh, sold a spot for a million dollars, a local spot for the, uh, for the Super Bowl. So I think there's still something to be said for that distribution system. Um, you mentioned your family, without getting too personal. <laughs> how is it having a, a, a media family? We have a media family uh, as well. I have somebody who works in, in local television. And uh, does, does that spark a lot of discussions about these issues? Oh, uh, of course it does. Yeah. Of course it does. And in fact, my yeah. wife's career, I think, to a certain extent, reflects um, the, the recent history of the news business. When she first started, um, she had a cameraman, she had a sound man, <laughs> She had a producer. Uh, they would go out and they would do their story and they would shoot it microwave to New York and the editors there would edit it. Then, then pretty soon the producer went away and then not so long after that the sound man went away and then one day the cameraman was told that he was going to have to edit too. So uh, that now is all very self-contained uh, and my wife actually likes that because she likes to have mm -hmm. control over the stories that she's doing and not just sending notes to an editor in New York and hoping that uh, the fonts are right uh, and the names are right. Uh, so it's, um, she's, she's made the change, I think, pretty, pretty easily. I think in fairness to our audience, we should identify her as yes. Jennifer McLogan of uh, CBS2. That's and correct. Terrific yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're reporter. Not, we're not trying that. to make it a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, you know, I think that's one of the things we tell students is to prepare yourselves now on all those platforms that at one time it was great to be the best editor in the world or the best producer in the world but now you have to combine all those skills and be on all those platforms. Absolutely. Um, what, do you, what do you see for the, for the future of this school? Do you see more expansion? Are there plans for more expansion? I know that we have a lot of work going on right now for planning for a new facility, a new building. How important is a facility for a school of, of communication. Absolutely, media. absolutely essential. I mean, it, it, uh, it is uh, part and parcel uh, to the identity of that school. So at the moment, we have people in disparate parts of the campus uh, who come together for meetings uh, and are working out this, uh, this identity for the school. But once they're centralized, once there's a building to walk into, it, it will make a huge difference. The, um when, when you look at facilities, though, I guess there's, there's a debate as to what you're going to need five to seven years out because we're trying to look in that crystal ball, right? right. And, and how, do you, how do you prepare? I mean, what do, you, what do you see at this point? I know when you have a major news component, you need a large newsroom, right? That's right. One, of the mm -hmm. one of the things. Sure. Um, and in addition to that, though, um, as far as the rest of the college, when we talk about... Um, the, for example, the, uh, the music program. I mean, there have been so many terrific programs there. I think there was somebody last year who, uh, who, who won a Grammy, right, for, a, uh, for an opera that right. he produced. Yep. I mean, what, what kind of things are going on? Give, give everybody a sense out there uh, in the public. Well, um, th historically, the core mission of the School of Music has been music education, mm -hmm. uh, preparing music educators. And I think to a certain degree that, that's still true. Uh, Robert Cart, the director, um, is... Uh, really uh, quite a talented musician, uh, not only um, a, a tenor, a concert tenor, but also a flautist. Uh, so he, his interest is bringing up the performing aspects um, in, that, in that school. So I, I expect that we'll see from Cali um, more of an emphasis on performance, uh, on chamber music. But at the same time, I don't think that that the, uh, that the musical education program will be totally abandoned. It's, it is central to what they do, and it's, uh, I think, a, a very important um, aspect of what they do. Do you think that a lot of people in the arts should be preparing themselves for teaching, that that's really uh, an important part of their, of their background? Uh, well, I think that they should be looking for ways to find applications for, for what they're doing. Uh, in addition to music education, there's music, music therapy, for example, uh, and uh, a growing program at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Very interesting. Uh, in art and design, we have uh, industrial design and, uh, and graphic design. These are, I think, uh, opportunities for students to pursue creative careers where there's a real need. Now, there is a... I I think it's fair to say a labor of love that you were involved in before you left 
Brooklyn College. Right. And that has to do with the Steiner Studios and, and the project there. Just tell us about it, because I found it very uh, fascinating. Sure. Uh, really, the last five years of my life have been um, occupied in developing this graduate school of cinema, which will be situated in the Steiner Studios, which itself is uh, located at the, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Steiner Studios is the largest production facility outside of Los Angeles. They have uh, 10 sound stages at the moment, uh, big commercial sound stages. Uh, their aim is to get up to 30 eventually, which will make them probably the largest production facility in the country. Um, within their campus, there is a 235,000 square foot building that they are developing, and that's where the, um, where the, the graduate school of, uh, of cinema is going to be located. That's huge. Um, well, <laughs> well, not the whole building. Oh, okay. No. okay. It's only going to be about two floors of that. Okay. But uh, there will be uh, three separate degree programs with um, over a dozen different concentrations. And ultimately, when it's up and running, there will be about 425 graduate students going there, in addition to uh, advanced undergraduates who will be shifting between there and the main campus. So it was a, um, an opportunity to develop a site. Uh, to do some uh, major fundraising mm -hmm. uh, and to develop a curriculum. And, uh, and at this point, I think they're hoping to get it up and running by, um, by September of 2014. That's exciting. That's very it exciting. Is. It's going to be great. But, but we're going to be racing them, right? We are. In, in many ways. We are. In many ways. In many ways. Yeah. What's, um, so when we're sitting here five years from now, what, what, are, we gonna, what are we going to say about this uh, school at that point, do you think? Well, we're going to say that it's a, a bit bigger than what it is now. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, the School of Communication Media is in the mid-600s, I think, 647, something like that. Uh -huh. um, I think it will be closer to um, 1,000 students by then. Uh, I expect that in addition to the journalism program that there are going to be some uh, other programs that come along the way. Uh, ideally, there will be some graduate program that, uh, that gains attention. And, and people will start to think of Montclair as a place where, uh, where media education is happening, but also where connections with the media industry are happening. We're, we have our Center for uh, Cooperative Media here and uh, bringing in a lot of partners, NJTV, uh, WNYC is, uh, is taking over the New Jersey Public Radio and, um, and running operations out of here. We've got um, uh, uh, some, some local folks, uh, web uh, sites as well that are being operated out We've of there. We've done a lot in a short period of time. It's, it's really yeah. quite impressive, yeah. It's, it's I wish I could take credit for it. Well, it's, it's <laughs> exciting to have you here with us uh, to, to help chart the course going forward. Thanks. And, uh, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate thank you. it. And thank you for watching as well. If you would like information on this or any other edition of Carpe Diem, you can write us at the email address on your screen or call us at 973-655-5158. I'm Mark Rosenwig for all of us at Montclair State University. Thanks for watching Carpe Diem.